Now on to this evening. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to present our speaker, um, Sarah Glynn, um, whose uh, work I've come across time and time again, probably over the last few years, but this project has given me the opportunity to actually uh, inter interact with the work a little bit more deeply. So it's really lovely to, to have uh, Sarah here. Um, Dr. Sarah Glynn is an architect, academic and activist. Uh, she's, an author, she's the author of Cla Class, Ethnicity and Religion in the Bengali East End, as well as numerous articles about the Tower Hamlets community. Uh, she has worked as a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and currently works with the Kurdish community in Strasbourg, where she is joining us uh, from today. Uh, she will be speaking about the ways in which Bengalis living in Tower Hamlet supported the independence struggle and set this in the historical context of East End activism. Her talk is called Joy Bangla, How to Support a War from 5,000 Miles Away. Her presentation will last for about 40 minutes and then we'll have the chance uh, to ask her some questions. So we'll open the Q&A up to the audience. In the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, as Sanjida mentioned, please do just pop them into the chat box and we will We'll get back to you in, um, in about 45 minutes or so. Um, so I will now hand it over to Sarah. Thank you so much. And um, please share your presentation when you can. Hi, so I'll, I'll just get that um, screen sharing going. And um, yeah, really, really nice to be here. But let me just get the, the technical side out of the way. Um, Okay, so hopefully, is that working? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So yes, very flattered to, to be asked to give a talk on such an important anniversary for the community. And this is a subject that I looked at for my PhD, which later became this, <laughs> which you've just heard, yeah. Um, and what I want to try to do today is really get across a sense of that time as well as to put it into context and I realize that there may be people in the audience with first-hand experience of it so I hope that you'll feel that this account does correlate with your memories and you'll take the opportunity to correct me and tell me what I've left out in the questions afterwards. So in when I was asked to do this I, I realized that I'd actually done most of my research for this 20 years ago, um, which of course was only 30 years after the events that we're looking at, and many more of the key figures were then still alive. Um, I've also made use of interviews by Caroline Adams, the recorded interviews which are in the Tower Hamlets Library, and more recent interviews by the Shadonata Trust as well. And in those 20 years since I did the research, I've had quite a lot of opportunity to think about these issues. And especially when I myself was campaigning for independence for Scotland in 2014. And now that I'm working with the Kurdish community. And I think those, my own activism has given me a greater understanding of the Bengali movement. But I've also learned from the Bengali movement in what I've done since. So today I want to begin with an introduction to the, com um, to the community with the cast of the story, as it were. Um, then look a bit at the political engagement with the politics of homeland before 1971. Then the bulk of the, the thing, the, the contribution to the fight for Indy from the UK. And then just finish up with a quick look at the impact of the campaign on the UK Bengali community and at wider lessons that we can learn. But first, a very quick bit of earlier history for background, because I'm aware that perhaps not everyone may be familiar with this. So we're looking back today at 50 years of Bangladesh, but the independence from the UK and the creation of Pakistan in India was in fact only 24 years earlier than that. So that many of the people who were involved in 1971 had clear memories of those earlier campaigns, even if only from their childhood. And the Bengalis in London took part in those earlier campaigns too. Though of course, at that time, there were only a few of them in London, just a few hundred. So they would first be campaigning for independence as part of the Indian National Congress, and then with the Muslim League for a separate Pakistan. 
and the London branch of the Muslim League was established in 1945 by Abbas Ali, who's pictured here in the hat. And they basically argued that Muslims would not be safe as a minority in Hindu majority India and that they needed their own country. So with independence in 1947, you had the partition which divided British ruled India or formerly British ruled India into India and Pakistan. And Select, where most of the East End Bengalis come from, was actually given a re referendum over which they wanted to join because the British had administered Select as part of Assam, not Bengal, and they chose, but they chose to become part of Pakistan. So the lines drawn by these British officials on the map created a Pakistan of two halves that, that shared little other than religion. And West and East Pakistan, which was initially called East Bengal, are separated by over a thousand miles of India. And the political and economic power was all concentrated in the West, although despite its smaller size, there's actually a bigger population in East Pakistan. And East Pakistan quickly discovered that they'd gone from one colonial relationship into what was almost another, where even their language was not recognized as an official language. But before going on to look at these events, I, I just want to look quickly at the London and specifically the East End Bengali community as it was in 1971. So at that time, there were about 22,000 people from East Pakistan, the future Bangladesh, living in the UK and about 3,000 of them were in the East End. And most of that East End community was made up of ex-merchant seamen who jumped ship, or their relatives or others from their village who come to the UK under the work voucher scheme. And most of these people expected to earn money and then return. So their wives and families were generally still in Bengal. And they were working really hard in the rag trade, in unskilled, low paid jobs, in the beginnings of jobs in the growing Indian restaurant industry. And they, they were working very long hours and generally lacked formal education or time for much political education, but they were intensely and personally affected by the events that were happening back home in Bengal. And besides them, there was a smaller group of, of businessmen, including the restaurant owners, people perhaps who'd had time to become a bit more established or had a little bit more money or education when they came. And this group was able to provide more resources, practical resources for the campaign. And then besides them, there was a more educated, politicized group of students and professionals often living in other parts of London, but who'd come to the East End for their politics, to, to discuss politics and to give practical help to the East End community through the Welfare Association. And this educated, um, more wealthy group were able to provide the energy and inspiration to a lot of the campaigning and, and the students basically dropped everything else to focus full time on the campaign in 1971. And I think this educated group really embody a sort of political legacy of South Asian aristocratic leftism, for want of a better word. Um, you know, they were more inspired by a sort of sense of fairness and duty to help rather than a greatly sort of class conscious leftism. Uh, but they were boosted by this more general sort of left and progressive movement of student politics at that time, because we're, we're talking about not long after 1968. Um, the, the professional group was, was rather more settled. Um, more, many more of them had wives and families. And of course, there were a few professional women themselves. So a lot of the women were at home looking after the, their children, but they had a lot more freedom than the few wives who, who were living in, in the East End. So just before looking at events in particular, I thought I'd just introduce a couple of key characters in, in this group, this sort of more professional educated group. 
And of course, there are many other people that were important too, but I think just, just giving a bit of background of these two may help us to understand the, the dynamics of what was happening. So 20 years ago, as I said, I was still able to talk to some of the key people involved, but sadly not to Tassaduk Ahmed because he'd had a stroke and he literally couldn't speak. But he's, he did do... But he did do recordings with Caroline Adams and he is remembered by other people. And he was very much a key Sorry. figure in helping bring people together. And I've, I've left the event. Things. It's too annoying. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry, Sarah. Sorry. We're just in the process of muting a few people. Apologies for that. I think Lorna Jackson, if you could mute yourself, please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Shall I go on? So Tassaduk was very much a key figure in helping bring people together in an organizing. And he was the owner of the Ganges restaurant that you've got up on your screen there. And he was very much an example of an aristocratic communist, came from a landowning family. He was active in the Muslim League in the, in the founding party of Pakistan, but he became a communist when he saw how the new Pakistani elites were really just acting to advance their own interests. And he became a political exile in London in the early 1950s. And he was very soon very active in helping get the East End, the, um, well, then called the Pakistan Welfare Association, properly organized and active. And Tassadu acted as a mentor to students, encouraging them to read and to discuss political ideas. Um, in this picture, which was taken in Allgate in the 1970s, you can see Tassaduke in the centre with the glasses and tie. And then from the left, you've got Fakhruddin Ahmed, who was his perhaps rather more pragmatic friend. And you've got Nur al-Islam. And then on the right with the hat, you've got Atto Rahman Khan, the Bengali politician. Nur al-Islam, the second from the left, came to London in 1956 to study as a barrister. And he told me about the discussions that he and other students would go to that were organised by Tassaduk, where Tassaduk would tell them, quote, it's no good going for capitalism. And what's the good of becoming this barrister and solicitors? And you want to exploit people? Rather educate yourself. Read Marx, Engels, Rousseau, Voltaire, Maxini, go for Tolstoy, War and Peace. So T Tassaduk was obviously a really dynamic person, and I think there's no better indication of that than, than the comment that the Reverend Kenneth Leach recalled at his funeral, that whenever he met Tassaduk, and I quote, he wouldn't necessarily say, good morning, or nice to see you, he would rather say, now the next thing is, so the, the other person I want to introduce is Sheikh Manan who came to the UK in 1964, and he had to actually withdraw from studying law for financial reasons, but he got a job and he studied journalism, and he became a pres president of the left-wing Pakistan Democratic Front. And he told me that he first began to realize that Pakistan was a trap, as he called him, when, called it, when he was living in, in Dhaka in 1948, when he was only 14. And he said, by the end of 1950, I had no doubts in my mind that we are a colony. So Sheikh Mujib, the, the future leader of Bangladesh, was actually a neighbor and family friend, but Manan's own politics were well to the left of Mujib's. And Manan played a, a leading organizational role in London. So having introduced you perhaps to some of the, the characters and, and the nature of the community, I'm going to go back to a sort of more historical timeline. And whoops, I well, didn't mean to do that yet. Oh, never mind, we'll have to put up with that. Um, and a return to East Pakistan history. Um, so after independence and partition, as we've noticed, East Pakistan quickly discovered that they'd gone into a new colonial relationship where even their language was not recognized as an official language. And protests for recognition of the Bengali language were already taking place in 1948. And of course, the importance of language recognition is really huge for oppressed groups. So it affects culture, it affects identity, and it also affects economic opportunity and power relations. And International Mother Tongue Day 
is now widely celebrated, but I think most people who celebrate it are not actually aware of the significance of the date, the 21st of February at Cushy, and that it commemorates the day in 1952 when students in Dhaka protested the government reneging on a promise to recognize Bengali as a state language. And the protests were met with live ammunition and a batting charge, which left 19 people dead. So the Shahid Minar Memorial on Altar Ali Park, which you can see here, is a small version of the one to the language martyrs in Dhaka. In 1949, the Awami League was as broke away as established as a, as a break away from the Muslim League. And their central demand was regional autonomy for actually all the different states that make up Pakistan. And they also had a more leftish program. And then in 1954, pro-autonomy parties actually won big in the East Pakistan elections. But the, um, the Pakistan government in Islamabad responded to that by just dismissing the provincial government. And a lot of exiled leaders actually came to London, where Abdul Manan's house in Kensington and his Green Mask restaurant in Brompton Road became a centre of political activity. So in the picture, you've got Abdul Manan on the left, Aftar Ali, the um, Bengali Siemens leader, and then with the beard and the long, co long coat, um, Molana Bashani. So, Bashani was known as the Red Maulana. He was one of the founders of the Awami League, though he later founded a more left-wing party. And he was clearly a really charismatic leader, combining Islam and left politics. So I suppose a sort of Muslim liberation theology, you might call it. And he was political mentor to Tassaduk and also to Sheikh Mujib, the, the first prime minister of Bangladesh. So the, the next major driver of political activity was the coup in Pakistan that took place in 1958, led by General Ayub Khan, and the campaign against the subsequent military rule, the campaign for a return to democracy. And in that campaign, the Bengalis, were, the, the people, from, um, people from East Pakistan were clearly campaigning alongside people from West Pakistan who also wanted to see um, return to democracy. But at the same time, there was a growing movement for East Pakistani rights and freedoms, and for some people for independence. And at that, a, a booklet produced in London at that time called Unhappy East Pakistan actually concluded that East Pakistan, <clears throat> if things continued, would become a virtual colony of West Pakistan. And the driving force of all these campaigns was the students who gathered around Tassaduk Ahmed. And these students were also practically involved in the East End community through, through the Welfare Association. So they, these same students, you know, they were doing the, they were having their discussions with Tassadu, the, the intellectual discussions, they were getting involved in the campaigns, but they were also doing the practical stuff, helping out at the welfare. And then you've also got the role played by the restaurant owners who were acting as patrons, providing meeting spaces, financing things like the cost of printing, and actually in the mid 60s, financing the purchase of a house in Highbury, which they called East Pakistan House, which acted as an organizing center come student hostel. So some of the more radical students at this time were already sort of trying to find out about guerrilla fighting training, but many people in the Bengali community were not yet even receptive to the idea of autonomy they'd fought for Pakistan and they weren't ready to see this being divided up in any way. But then in 1966, Sheikh Mujib, the, the leader of the Awami League, announced the six point program for East Pakistan autonomy. And this became a focus of mass movement. In response, the Pakistan government arrested Mujib and other leaders and accused them of conspiring within India to cause secession to break up Pakistan. So in response, all the different, different Bengali political groups came together to campaign for Mujib's release. 
and the, the leftists were obviously involved in this as well and added some more socialist demands of their own and Bashani was very involved in actually leading protests for the, for the release. In London, there were huge demos of thousands of people, including women's with, women with prams from that more educated Bengali middle class who led a torchlight procession from Hyde Park to the Pakistan High Commission. Activists actually forced entry to the High Commission and set fire to the portrait of Ayub Khan, the Pakistan president. And when Khan came to London, he had to escape from the back door of his hotel due to all the protesters at the front. The activists around the East Pakistan House formed com a committee chaired by Abdul Mamun, who we met earlier, and raised enough money to send a QC to Pakistan to actually help in Mujib's legal defense. But in February um, 1969, in the face of mass unrest, Ayub Khan released Sheikh Mujib and then, then in March, Ayub Khan resigned. He handed over control to General Yahya Khan, who promised elections in 1970. But before the elections, which were scheduled right for the end of the year, happened, on November the 11th, 1970, East Pakistan was hit by a massive cyclone and tsunami. In fact, the, it was the deadliest tropical cyclone that's ever been recorded, and it left 300,000 people dead in East Pakistan alone. And the inaction of the West Pakistan authorities, the, the official Pakistan authorities based in West Pakistan, was, was really hit hard. And there was in, in the UK, of course, there was mass mobilization for emergency relief. But the election went ahead on the 7th of December. Um, it was boycotted by Bashani's party because he felt that with that, this level of chaos and starvation, it wasn't right to have an election. So, but it went ahead and Bengali hopes absolutely centered on the Awami League. And the Awami League won 160 out of 162 directly elected East Pakistan seats. So that gave them an overall majority in the National Assembly because um, the seats are in proportion to the number of people and there were more people in East Pakistan, so they had more seats. So they had an absolute majority. Um, but and just to, just to give you a comparison, Zulfika Ali Bhutto's Pakistan People's Party, the PPP, won 81 seats. Um, but General Yahya Khan and Bhutto wouldn't accept an Awami League government. And there were lots of no negotiations, they weren't getting anywhere. Bhutto said that the PPP would boycott the assembly, which was planned to start on the 3rd of March and um, Yahya Khan preempted that on the 1st of March by declaring that the assembly had been postponed indefinitely. There were mass demonstrations in East Pakistan and the more radical elements, including the students, were calling for independence. Sheikh Mujib announced a general strike, a shutdown of all essential services. Generally, the protests were, took the form of non-violent, non-cooperation, but that didn't stop the Pakistani firing on demonstrators and killing unarmed protesters. Then on the 7th of March, Sheikh Mujib responded to the huge movement from below and declared, this time our struggle is a struggle for freedom. This time our struggle is a struggle for independence. So meanwhile in London, um, there was of course a flood of activity Lots of marches from Hyde Park to the Pakistan High Commission, where there was a constant vigil. On the 5th of March, activists pulled down and burnt the flag, the Pakistan flag outside the High Commission. There were demonstrations in all the towns where Bengalis lived. And on the 7th of March, the time of Sheikh Mujib's much anticipated speech, there were over 10,000 people in Hyde Park. And that night, protesters didn't leave the High Commission till three in the morning. Sheikh Manan has described the atmosphere in the Pakistani students' hostel 
as a left internationalist, he was very much trying to keep the West Pakistan students on board, but their sympathies eventually ran out. So the students were listening to Mujib's speech on the hostel radio and quote, and then there was excitement, disappointment and frustration. So one of the students got up and he got the picture of Muhammad Ali Jinnah from the wall and tore it into pieces. There was some hue and cry among the students who were still sympathetic to Pakistan, but they did not dare say anything. In East Pakistan, the, the movement was still growing and discussions were still going on between the politicians, but the Pakistan army was building up their troops and the Bengalis were doing their best to build, get prepared for the inevitable defense. So in the UK, everyone was very busy. Committees were forming everywhere. There were committees of students, of doctors, of women, committees for the different towns. And these groups were able to build on the, the committees that they'd had recently for the cyclone relief. There were loads of discussions, lots of leaflet writing, and a lot of waiting for directions from Bengal. And then on the night of the 25th of March, what's become known as Kaloratri or Black Night, the Pakistan army launched a violent crackdown that left thousands of people dead, specifically targeted universities and journalists, attacked Bengal army cantonments, which ensured, of course, that the remaining uh, battalions turned against West Pakistan and arrested Mujib. The next day in London, pro um, protesters were actually arrested trying to take over the Pakistan High Commission and hoist the Bangladesh flag. There were big, passionate, chaotic meetings, including demonstrations in Trafalgar Square, and people basically wanted to do all they could to help. Adrian Nessa Pasha um, has described a meeting in Birmingham um, where they, she started off financial don donations by giving the jewellery that she was wearing. And hundreds of people were themselves ready to volunteer to go and fight in, in East Pakistan. But the Bangladesh government in exile, so that's the, the political leaders from Bangladesh who escaped to India and set up a government in exile there, they said no they, they didn't want, apart from doctors which would be helpful, they didn't want people to come from the UK to fight, they thought they were more useful actually campaigning for propaganda in the UK. So very few people went over, though a number did go over to, to try and bring back um, members of their family to safety. Of course people in the UK were absolutely desperate for news, they were would read, every, read and share every letter that was smuggled out from family and friends. And people would gather in the restaurants and in the coffee houses to share the latest information, the latest plans for demonstrations and protests. And men who were illiterate in any language bought the British papers for others to read and translate for them. So the, the, the violence of the crackdown and, and, and of the appalling news that was coming out from Bangladesh ensured that most people in the community very quickly became wholehearted supporters. And this was very much exemplified by this quote from Nawab Ali in an interview with Caroline Adams. I supported Bangladesh too, not immediately of course, because we fought to make Pakistan, so we didn't want to lose it. But when we saw the newspapers, the photographs of what they'd done to Bengali women, then we supported it. Eight of my family were in the Mukti, the, the Mukti Bahini translates as Liberation Army. So it was a time of frantic activity and long drawn out waits for news, of passionate involvement and also of destructive factionalism because like any important political movement, it suffered from contested structures, contested focus of activity, and since from contested history. And, and there were even two rival um, Awami League organizations. Um, personal rivalries between different people were magnified by community bonds, but there were also political differences too. So 
the left groups imagined the the future in the future that there a much more socialist Bangladesh and the groups that were perhaps more linked to the pro P King groups you might call them envisaged really tactical big tactical differences and they actually organized separately and envisaged, envisaged a sort of um, peasant Maoist revolution and you'll be, but you'll be glad to know I'm not really going to look into all the ins and outs of this but I I think I just want to give you one quote which does give a um, a sense of the contested organisation, a flavour of it, and it, it's from a convention that was held in Coventry on the 24th of April, where they were trying to sort out overall campaign coordination and organisation, and it's from an interview with Lulu Bilquis Banu, um, done by Caroline Adams. So Mrs Banu was then working as a school teacher and she and completing a PhD in London and she'd been a student activist alongside Sheikh Mujib in Dhaka in 1948 and she recalled of, of this convention. They wanted someone to preside over the conference so as soon as someone's name was proposed the others shouted no 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 he's a thief he's a swindler he's so and so and then someone suggested Mrs Banu and I said don't be silly in this pandemonium I'm going to preside they're breaking the chairs, hitting each other. There was so much animosity. So suddenly Animal Hook said, we've tried to start this meeting for the last one hour, but no one seems to agree who should preside. Will Mrs. Banu preside? And they all clapped. And there was absolute calm, not one protest, because I was absolutely non-political, non-partisan. She was also, of course, one of the few women present, and I suspect the men were reluctant to subject a woman to that sort of riotous protest. The problem of overall coordinator was resolved by co-opting co Abu Said Chowdhury, um, the, the former vice chancellor of Dhaka University and judge in Dhaka High Court, who'd been made ambassador by the government in exile. And they also appointed two neutral non-Bengalis to supervise the money collection. There was, of course, huge support for the Awami League, which was seen basically as the party of independence. And the students and professionals who themselves belonged to more left-wing movements adopted what they called a popular front politics, so that they were basically working alongside the Awami League and focusing on independence. Then um, there was important role organizing roles for the traditional sort of patrilineal lineage that the Gushti organizations the, um, from the Bengali community who could get large numbers of people out to demonstrations. And then the restaurant owners were able to help provide funding for coaches etc though some of them weren't always too keen to let their staff go off um, for business reasons so you've got all those different groups um, the main tasks in the uk were basically propaganda and fundraising so they wanted to mobilize the whole bengali community and Sheikh manan remembers canvassing every single house and flat. And in line with his popular front politics, he avoided pushing more left-wing ideas and spoke, as he said, only for liberation. They were very aware of the strategic importance of London, that British newspapers and radio would re reach a worldwide audience. And as Sheikh Manon put it, if we create a ripple, that will immediately be circulated in the world. So they were organizing demonstrations, they were showing films, they were creating street drama, they were putting together fact sheets, they held hunger strike, a hunger strike outside the House of Commons till Peter Shaw, the very sympathetic um, MP for Stepney, promised to raise concerns inside the Commons. They protested when the Pakistan cricket team came. They protested outside embassies of countries that were selling Pakistan weapons or giving Pakistan aid. And they sent a delegation to Paris for a demonstration at the Pakistan Aid Consortium meeting, which was headed by the World Bank. And they lobbied a lot of influential people, including MPs. 
the weren't so many women, but they did play an important role. There was a um, very active small group of better educated middle class women who were very busy um, in doing all sorts of things from fundraising, lobbying, to pub even public speaking in Trafalgar Square. And sometimes they did manage to coax some of the East End women to join them on the women's demonstrations. So Kulsum Ulla, who was in an interview with Jamo Iqbal for the Swadhanata Trust, um, remembers at that time there were few Bengali women here and they were also unwilling to come out of their houses. That's why we had to collect people going door to door. The husbands demanded their full security and told us to bring them back home. It was our responsibility to drop them off safely. Kulsum Ulla herself wasn't afraid to make her voice heard and she recalled standing in the road between a Bengali shop and a Pakistani shop telling people to boycott the Pakistanis. Uh, there was a, in, they were very aware of the importance of using first-hand witnesses to raise people's awareness and one of these was Noor al-Islam, who we met earlier on, who was in East Pakistan when the hostilities broke out. So he immediately took up arms and he was soon based with other freedom fighters in India. But when the Liberation Command knew about his former activism, they were very keen to send him back to London. And he explained he could only tear himself away for about two months from the fighting, but he did go go to London to tell people about what was happening. So the demands that the activists were putting to, to both the UK and other governments were, they were asking them to put diplomatic pressure on the Pakistan government to stop selling Pakistan arms, to stop sending Pakistan aid on which they relied for their economy and also for their substantial military expenditure to expel Pakistan from the Central Treaty Organization, which was a Cold War military alliance, um, to press Pakistan to release Sheikh Mujib, to try Yahya Khan for crimes against humanity, to recognize Bangladesh, and to send aid to help with the humanitarian crisis. So the Bengalis in Britain were doing all that they could to keep the war on the international political agenda. And this also helped provide vital encouragement to the people who were living and fighting in East Pakistan. And so what were the results of all this lobbying? Well, it's hard to tell because you've got no controlled experiment, but um, well, the World Bank, who also made a visit of their own to East Pakistan, recommended that there should be no new aid given to Pakistan. Um, the UK government said that they would continue existing projects but give no new aid and they claimed to have no outstanding arms contracts of any significance. Um, but Nixon and Kissinger in the US did continue to send Pakistan aid and military exports. So the other big thing that they were doing was fundraising and the community raised 400,000 pounds, which would be the equivalent of about five and a half million today. And it was, many people gave regular contributions. Sometimes people threw in whole unopened wage packets and the money was collected on Saturdays after the Friday payday. And it was used for administration. Some of it was used for relief work. So things like this Joy Bangla ambulance, um, the pictures from Kulsum Ulla, who we met earlier, and she is actually in this photograph with her husband and children. But the hope of a lot of the donors was that the majority of the arms of the money would be used by arms for the Mukti Bahini, the Liberation Army. And the um, Bangladesh government in exile did actually make a direct appeal for this, but plans for direct aid to the Mukti, Mukti Bahini were immediately crushed by the Indian government and Sheikh Manan explained what happened. He said, high hopes were raised and everybody was thinking that his or her money was buying arms, but when we con contacted the Indian High Commission, we were met with a blank refusal. 
So they were told that the arms collected, the sums of money collected were too small for modern warfare. The old man sat and laughed. He said, young man, how much money do you have? I said, the more weapons we send, the more money will come from the pockets of our people. Then he said, how big is the pocket? But Sheikh Manon wasn't going to give up so easily. So together with some colleagues, he contacted a man who'd been in the Pakistani Navy, who said that he could supply small arms privately. And this man produced a small sample bomb, which they actually tested out in the hills outside Cheltenham in the early hours of one morning. But when they went and told Ch Justice Chowdhury about it, he was appalled. Quote, he banged his head against the table. He said, of all the people, you did go to do this thing. You've frustrated me, you've disappointed me, and you've crushed me. How on earth the British government will allow it? And if they know tomorrow that you've done this, my existence in this country will be threatened. The whole movement overseas will be stopped. Why did you do that? So they had to stop saying they were going to collect money for arms. And rather more prosaically, the bulk of the money was finally handed over to the Bangladesh government after the war and used to establish a foreign currency reserve for the new state bank. So while the movement was very big, not everybody, not of course, supported Bangladesh. Um, there were still some people who felt that they didn't want to see the breakup of Pakistan, people who might be a bit more conservative, a bit more Islamist, or just found old loyalties hard to change. And one of these was actually Abbas Ali, who founded the Muslim League, who we saw in the first picture. And then there were also in London, West Pakistanis who didn't support it. And there were clashes between East and West Pakistanis, including between school children. And there were attacks on West Pakistani owned shops. When it came to Eid, the Bengalis decided to boycott the East London mosque so they didn't actually have to pray alongside West, Bengal, West Pakistanis. But then on the 3rd of December, India entered the war in support of Bangladesh. And less than two weeks later, on the 16th of December, pa Pakistani forces surrendered to the Indian commander in Dhaka. Sheikh Mujib was released and he returned to Dhaka via London. So and when he reached Bangladesh, he'd actually already been declared president in a ceremony that was held at Claridge's Hotel in London on the 8th of January 1972. So we could end here as if it was happy ever after, but we know that it wasn't as simple as that. That Bangladesh was devastated, that rebuilding was really difficult, that corruption in the new government actually compounded the economic crisis, and that there was a coup in 1975, and that was followed by counter coups. In fact, few of the Bengalis who lived in London, the Londonis as they're called, actually did go back to live in, in the new Bangladesh. And many, many more people came the other way, especially wives and families. And, and that included a lot of people who had direct experience of the war and were ready to, when they came to the UK, to continue to struggle for their rights there. And these people came to the UK to escape the chaos of Bangladesh in response to the horrors of the time of separation and re in response to, to tightening immigration controls. And there were also some people who'd fought on the West Pakistan side or the Pakistan side and um, didn't want to stay in the independent Bangladesh. So what was the, what was the impact of this of this struggle on the UK community. I think it made the community more confident, more active, though not particularly in a very left wing way, despite the role of so many left activists in the campaign. And I think that is a result of the popular front politics that they followed and of what they call the stages theory, the idea that you work along, uh, alongside others for national liberation first and then only after you've got the national liberation 
would you put forward your more socialist, more radical demands? But of course, things don't work that way. Once people have, have got power, they're not going to listen to, uh, to different demands. And in 1971, Sheikh Mujib very quickly dismissed suggestions that there should be a, a national government of, of all the different groups involved and new elections. And in fact, Sheikh Manan recalled that Mujib's position had already been made very clear to himself and his colleagues in London. So, as he said, um, he, to quote, clearly indicated to me at the airport, there is no possibility of a co coalition government. He told me in frank language, four of us, that I've contested election only the other day. I even argued with him the other day it was in Pakistan. They were members of the Pakistani parliament. They're not representative of Bangladesh. But he said, no, I cannot ignore the public mandate. You can come to the country and work. So I was removed from everything. I could not associate myself with the government, so I did not go. I was provided with free tickets. I refused. But Manan and his friends had also played down left ideas in their campaigning in London. And you could argue that the left groups actually lost out on much of their earlier potential as the community's leadership. And future involvement of the community in London in Bangladeshi politics was mostly through the Awami League and then later through other parties in power. But they also used their new confidence for a more pragmatic politics to get accepted and more fairly treated in London, but not really to argue for a more sort of fundamental socialist change to the system. And as part of this, they very much built on the links they'd made with the Labour Party. Um, Peter Shaw, the Stepney MP, told me, I found myself very quickly and deeply involved. And he said that afterwards he had an ongoing and very close relationship with the community and indeed with their leaders. And also that there was a feeling of some considerable overlap of values and outlook between the Awami League and the Labour Party. There was, as many people will know, it was quite a struggle before um, Bengalis were fully accepted as Labour Party members. The Liberation War has also made the division between more secular Bengalis and Islamists particularly bitter, as the Islamists then were on the other side and included some prominent figures accused, accused of horrific war crimes. But I don't think I'm going to go into that, that subject now. In fact, what I want to do is finish just by drawing out um, a couple of more general lessons learned um, that I've really taken with me in the 20 years um, since I did this research. So I myself have been activists an activist in many different campaigns and I've, I've found that the, the practices of organizing and lobbying are really very similar to what I've described um, in 1971 even though we now have the internet of course um, and they all show the vital importance of hard work with people on the ground that really there is no shortcut in campaigning and of the importance of being imaginative and of making use of all opportunities to get the message out. But I also keep returning to that Bengali example. So, for example, when I was campaigning for Scottish independence, we didn't just want to change the flag. We also wanted a fairer society. We wanted radical independence. But it was so difficult to persuade people that those ideas needed to be part of the package and not left till after independence. And whenever I was making that argument, I would actually bring up the example of Bangladesh. And today I'm working with the Kurds who do actually have a tradition very much of changing how things are done as integral to the, to the whole movement for political change. Um, and working with the Kurds has made me really appreciate the cultural as well as economic demands of a colonized people. And the image that I've just put up here is an example from the census and the 
recent campaign to, to get Kurds counted in the English and Welsh census and get Kurdish recognised as a language that people speak as well. And suppression of language is really very important to Kurdish politics. And I always like telling my Kurdish friends about why Language Day is celebrated on the 21st of February. So that's me and how it's affected me. But I really look forward to some questions and even more if people have got their own memories of that time. And I shall stop sharing my screen.